Josh Hoke from the Dome of the Rock for the inscriptions. And now we go into Muhammad himself. You're going to bite off an awful lot of what you want to then chew and try to help us understand. Because you are not just talking about one Muhammad. You're talking about two Muhammads. Now, I don't know where you're going with this. I don't, I have not seen, I've not heard where you're heading this. I, you've got my interest picked. Let's see where you do go. Who is this Muhammad one? Let's start with him. So tell me, I always assume the Islamic traditions tell me he's a man. I can see from the last uh, episode, he's not a man. He's nothing more than the praised be, be unto him. So that's the first probably one, but unpack it, show me, explain it to me so that I can understand this, this guy who's ignorant here. I'd love to be able to understand it. And I'm sure many others would also know with where you're gonna go with this Muhammad. Okay, over to you, Thomas. Oh yeah, thank you, Jay. Um, I guess we've no time to lose today. So I'm gonna start jumps straight in. Okay, so I've, I've titled this presentation Muhammad 1 and Muhammad 2, and you'll see why in a minute. Because Muhammad 1, that's the Muhammad we've been talking about so far. So that's the title for Jesus. It's first found on coins. It's used three times in the Quran and in the Dome of the Rock. Um, those three times are Surah 48, 29, 47, 2, and 3, 144. Okay, and well, it's based well, on the three Nassim. You say yeah. three times. We have four times in the Quran where Muhammad Jews. What do you mean by three times? Three times Muhammad one, one time Muhammad two. <laughs> ah, okay. So just so people don't think that you don't know how to count, you there are four references to Muhammad in the Quran, uh, but you're saying three of them are Muhammad one, and one of them is Muhammad two. Exactly. All right. So we have Muhammad one, which is the title for Jesus who is found on coins, um, who is used three times in the Quran and in the Dome of the Rock. And those three times in the Quran are Surah 48, 29, Surah 47, verse 2, and Surah 3, verse 144. And he is based on a pre-Nicene Syrian Christology and anti-Trinitarian Christology, which we've developed over the last couple of videos. Um, so that's the Muhammad one that I'm talking about. Now, Muhammad II, he is supposedly a person in history. It's the name of the prophet of Islam. He is the seal of the prophets, which is a title um, that's possibly taken from Mani Kazan. It's uh, already attested to Mani, but it's also uh, well attested in Christianity as a title for Jesus. So we first see it with Tertullian, um, who wrote, and eternal justice was manifested, and a holy one of holy ones was anointed, that is Christ, and sealed was vision and prophecy, and sins were forgiven. Therefore, since the prophecy was fulfilled through his advent, he said that vision and prophecy were sealed, because he is the seal of all prophets, fulfilling all things which in days bygone they had announced of him. So, as you can see, the seal of the prophets already attested to Jesus and to Mani, um, probably taken from one of the two. And this Muhammad II occurs once in the Quran, and that's 3340. Um, today, we have to say that this verse, 30, Surah 33, verse 40, that's uh, a, definitely a later interpolation. And that's something that David Powers showed in his book, Muhammad is not the father of any of you men. That's the title of the book. Um, where he really got, he looks at the oldest manuscripts that we have um, for this verse, and he finds that there were these lines were physically altered. So the, the number of lines is, is, is different than on any other page in the manuscript. It goes further into the margins um, than any other lines. So this is uh, most definitely a later edition, which we can see from physical, uh, we have the physical proof actually with those old manuscripts. Um, but also even, even the three times Muhammad is, is used for Jesus um, may very well be those may very well be later interpolations. So they're good arguments for why they are later interpolations as well. So it, it's uh, very likely that originally that there was no Muhammad in the Quran at all. So we're, we're basically looking at Muhammad one, the title for Jesus, and Muhammad two, the prophet. So, so Muhammad is first attested on coins in 661, and the parts of the Quran containing Muhammad are then likely written after 661 because that's the first time it appears like on those coins in in this way um, 
Muhammad as a title for Jesus was used until at least 756. And we looked at that when we did our timeline video. Um, that's the inscription at the sanctuary in Medina, which then was later turned into the tomb of the prophet. But originally it was not the tomb of the prophet. It was a Christian sanctuary. And it was the last time that we know of any inscription where Muhammad was used as a title for Jesus. Afterwards, it's all about the prophet. So this, this is around the time where this change um, happened. Um, so, but the historicization of the prophet like already started before 756. So this was probably a, a slow process um, that took place in the first half of the eighth century. Um, before Abd al-Malik, the Quran was a book used by pre nicene Syrian clergy, or I shouldn't say the Quran, the proto-Quran. Right? So these earlier parts of the Quran, this was used by pre nicene Syrian clergy, but afterwards it was really distributed widely um, in his empire. And because it was missing all those uh, markings, people who weren't familiar with the material to begin with had a hard time um, interpreting it. Because, uh, yeah, because the script is uh, so ambiguous. The old surahs, they read a lot like preachings of Syrian missionaries, um, which we've also seen before. Um, so presumably they are based on one or more unknown Aramaic speaking missionaries, and which ha don't have anything to do with Muhammad, at least not directly, because those passages um, then later could have been used or likely have been used um, to sort of justify um, a prophet Muhammad. So if they're, they're, whenever there's this unnamed prophet or not prophet, this unnamed um, preacher, um, whenever he occurs in the Quran, it's easy to impose or to use him as sort of a canvas to project Muhammad onto. So even though Muhammad is not named there, then now um, the translators would always put in Muhammad in brackets uh, when you look at translations. These are sort of the, um, this is sort of these, these old Syrian missionaries or the one, we don't know how many there are, um, but they, that are unnamed um, in the Quran, you know, which are a great canvas to project onto. So that, that certainly helped in this historicization process of, of the prophet Muhammad, because you could always point to the Quran and say, ah, oh, here, that, that must be him, that must be him, here's somebody, oh, that must be him. Yeah. Later surahs, um, so they would have been written in the second half of the 8th century and maybe even later, they no longer understand the Quran as a lectionary. So at that point, the Quran was no longer a means to explain scripture, but it was scripture itself. And it, the Quran compares itself to Torah and Gospels. Then Abraham, who was neither Jew nor Christian, according to Surah 367, was established as the father of the religion. And this referring back to Abraham was a way to step out of the shadow of Judaism and Christianity. Because right? they could always say, well, um, you're you're late to the party, right? We we know what uh, what uh, we've been here for a long time. Like, how, how come you know all of a sudden know better than us? And then the way to get around this, say, well, but we go back to Abraham. Like you falsified his teachings. We we go all the way back to him. So this is a step out of their shadow, but also a step into the direction of a separate religion. Because now now you're you're distancing yourself from everything that came before. But to do so. Let me just, let me just a guarantor. Yeah. Okay. Just so I'm aware, just so I, I, I'm, I'm following you. When you say earlier surahs versus later surahs, are you, are you in this case separating the Medinan and Meccan? Is that what you're doing by, by later and earlier? Or how do you delineate what is later and what is early? So one way is actually, well, the way that it has done, it has been done traditionally is to separate it according to the the like the hadith and the sira like so to map it to map the quran onto those stories which is probably not ideal but it's because um the sira was written much later right um it's probably not ideal but there are linguistic reasons to also separate them because the the you can tell the difference by the way they were written so the the earlier surahs is that they were much more like these Syrian preachers. Later surahs are more like a legal code and, and um, more elaborate. But there are also other ways of trying to, to date this. Um, so for instance, again, Raymond de Coeur, he's done 
something along those lines. He's actually looking for references to to the Quran in other sources. So for instance, the, the uh, biographies of the prophet and so on. And if you look at the earliest sources, they are not all, not all Quran verses are in there. So he thinks um, those Quran texts that are not in those earlier hadith, sources for the Hadith, they came actually later. So that's one way of dating them as well. Um, so there are different ways of, of going about it. Has yeah. someone done this, done a chronological order of the surahs? I mean, you, you mentioned... Let me show you something. Let me show you something. Uh, this is something... Well, I'm actually reading this right now. So wait, let me see if I can find this real quick. Ah, got it. So this is what Raymond de Kerr did. So these are... Wait, can you see this? Well, you, I'm just going to show you something I'm reading right now. So this is... I hope you can see this. I mean, even... even <laughs> Um, yeah, you probably won't be able to make much um, to make out a lot, but the thing is, what's what's depicted here is a list of all um, verses in the Quran, and then uh, Raymond de Kerr he color coded um, as many as he could. So there's still a lot of gray, so that means he he can't really date it. But the other colors they are all for a certain periods. So I think so. Red, for instance, is our Umayyad texts. Green are opposite texts. But he also he has different shades of green, so some are earlier, some are later. Um, I think purple are legal legal codes, um, and then blue and yellow come from other sources. Which, yeah. Um, but yeah, so this is sort of um, his attempt at, at sort of dating these these verses in, in a different way than what has done has been done before. Before it was mostly either by linguistic um, um, elements, so. The, the way things are phrased, which which indicates certain time, or going by the standard Islamic narrative and mapping it onto the on mapping the life of the Muhammad, which was written much later onto the Quran, and then sort of seeing uh, when. What when, book is that? So, we, so people can get it. What's the name of that book? Um, well, it, <laughs> uh, this is one of the Inara books. So this is uh, mostly in German. Actually, is there are articles here in English, French, and German. Um, the one I was referring to, that's actually all written in German. Um, this is the latest one. This is their 10th book. Um, this just came out last year. Oh, oh yeah, 21, 2021. Um, so I've just received this, actually. So I'm currently working through this. <laughs> okay, so that's still and, uh, not available in English for us to be able to like, use no, it. Probably not, not for some time. So far, they've only translated their first two books into English. So this is number 10. Um, you know, they they say they plan to translate them all eventually, but <laughs> we'll have to see uh, when that happens. All the more thankful where you're you're here, Thomas, to help us to see this part of the German mind that we don't get uh, those of us who are in uh, only dependent on English. Thank you so much. So that is an attempt to actually look at the chronology of the Quran using. Um, much of the material that he knows from that time period to put it in a chronological fashion. Back to our presentation. Um, yeah, so the last point I was at, um, in order to step out of the shadow of Judaism and Christianity, and in order to um, establish Abraham as the founder, so to, um, as the founder of your religion, you need a guarantor of scripture. Right? Somebody, like, you need a way of, of um, making sure that what you're saying is correct. So this person um, gains importance and actually, in fact, becomes necessary. Um, so the followers at this point in time, like after stepping out of this of, of the shadow of the of Judaism and Christianity, after establishing Abraham as the founder, the followers of the Quran, they now see themselves or also were seen as distinct from Jews and Christians. Um, and that's, for instance, reflected in Surah 9, 30 to 31. Um, and then the embellishment of Muhammad II's biography, right? So the, the Prophet Muhammad, that only took place in the 9th and the 10th centuries after the Quran was written. So that's why we don't really find Muhammad in the Quran, only in those few interpolations. And what we can see is this all builds upon one another. So in order to gain legitimacy vis-a-vis -vis the Christian orthodoxy, it was necessary to refer back to Abraham. But in order to re refer back to Abraham, it's necessary to understand the Quran as scripture. 
But in order to understand the Quran and scripture, it was necessary to have a guarantor for scripture. And to have a guarantor for scripture, it was necessary to create and embellish Muhammad as a prophet and as the seal of the prophet. And that in return means you now have a new religion. Now, this just doesn't mean that, that it was I mean, all you, done. You yeah. said a mouthful there. Could you unpack what you just meant by that? Yeah. In order to do this, you have to, in order to do this, if just uh, ex, uh, unpack that a little bit more because that's <laughs> huge. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, so in order, yeah, so let's, let's go this one by one. So in order to gain legitimacy vis-a-vis the Christian orthodoxy, it is necessary to refer back to Abraham because you need a point you need to go back further than the Christians do if you want to um, be seen as legitimate, because otherwise you can always say sort of your religion is a knockoff. Right? But if you say, no, we go actually back further than you, we go back all the way to Abraham and you are the ones who, who messed things up. You are the ones who falsified scripture. Then you can at least claim legitimacy. But if you want people to take that seriously, then we come to the next point. Um, Therefore, you need to have an actual scripture, not just a lectionary, not just some preachings. You need actual scripture. You need the word of God in that case. Because um, otherwise, um, yeah, you're just some, some random guy with, with, with a piece of text, right? Who claims to come uh, to go back to Abraham. So you need an actual scripture. But then in order to have the scripture, um, you also need a guarantor for it, right? Because anybody can claim anything to be scripture. So you need a prophet, you need um, somebody very special. And in this case, in more than a prophet, you even have a seal of the prophet, to, um, like the last of all prophets. But then if you want to have this prophet, well, then you have to obviously, If I mean, we're here at the point where this historization of Muhammad is already taking place, right? But you now you need to embellish this uh, Muhammad because, again, it's not enough just to be some some preacher. He needs to be the seal of the prophets. So that's why we need these these um, amazing biographies. But then the last step is obviously once you have that, once you have this embellished guarantor for scripture, this prophet, the seal of the prophets. Now you're definitely a new religion. You're no longer, um, yeah part of, of, of Christianity, because now somebody else has taken the, the spotlight, right? It's no longer about Jesus, now it's about the seal of the prophets. Um, but what I also want to point out is that this doesn't necessarily mean that all of this happened intentionally. I think it's probably at least as much an accidental um, development as it's an intentional one. Now, we know that the Abbasids, they obviously had a vested interest in, in establishing this. But I think they sort of they hopped on the train and then maybe they've pushed it a bit along. But this was something that happened organically, um, without without anybody like trying to to, to um, create a new religion um, like artificially. This is something that that just happened. Like as people start to misread, they start to read Muhammad into the Quran, and then once they started reading Muhammad into the Quran, it was sort of like one led to the to the other, right? It's it's not necessarily always intentional, even though there probably was some of that as well. Like, as I said, the, the Abbasids certainly had, had a vested interest uh, in this development. But they were building upon something that was going on anyway. I want to go back to the symbolism of the Dome of the Rock again real quick. And, with the, and I want to start with Surah 4, 157, 58 again, which we've already seen in the past. Um, there's this, and for their saying, indeed, we have killed the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. And they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but another was made to resemble him to them. And indeed, those who differ over it are in doubt about it. They have no knowledge of it except the following of the assumption. And they did not kill him for certain, rather Allah raised it to himself, and ever is Allah exalted in might and wise. Now, I want to read something that Christoph Luxemburg said about this because this now comes back to the symbolism of the Dome of the Rock. Now he says, later Islamic exegetes believed that they saw a reference in the misunderstood passages in Surah 4, 157-58, so that's what we've just heard, to the direct ascension of Christ to heaven. 
not noticing the other Quranic passages that contradict this understanding. As a result, they connected this ascension, at least in Islamic folk belief, with a reminiscence that had its origin in a Christian story. The story goes as follows. If one visits the Holy Land and wants to see the place atop the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, from which Christ ascended to heaven, one will be led into a walled courtyard in the middle of which a medium-sized stone rises up just a bit from the ground. There one will see, um, there, one will, there one will be pointed to two depressions hewn into the rock, which are supposed to be the footprints that Christ left behind at his ascensions. Incidentally, that same story, or this same story is told to the visitor of the Dome of the Rock. There though, the footprints are supposedly those of the white horse Burak on which uh, on whose back the Prophet Muhammad um, is to have made his journey to heaven. Now, what we can see here is that we can still see remnants of the Christian symbolism in this Islamic folk belief. And in this reinterpretation of the Christian symbolism, we can see a transfer from Muhammad I, Jesus, to Muhammad II, the prophet, and from Islam I, so this is pre nicene Christianity, to Islam II, the new religion. And this reinterpretation happened in two stages. First, the Dome of the Rock, which had previously, which we've um, heard there's this tomb uh, or this crypt in the Dome of the Rock, which was sort of a symbolic tomb for Christ. Um, this was then um, reinterpreted um, to be also the place of his ascension. And then only later was this ascension transferred from Jesus to Muhammad. And this explains why Jerusalem was the destination for pilgrimage before Mecca even, like, even was a thing. And this also explains the spacious precinct that lies around the Dome of the Rock, which served to receive all those masses of pilgrims. So yeah, so in this so in this this is this story is one example for how we see this transfer from the old like the Muhammad one to Muhammad new two from Jesus to the prophet. Now, as we saw before, the readers, thanks to Abdul Malik's Arabization policy, um, readers of the Quran they couldn't speak Aramaic anymore, and that's when sort of this misreading of Muhammad started. And initially, they started like initially Muhammad, the historic, historicized Muhammad, started out as a preacher because that's what those passages in the Quran, in the in the Proto Quran, are. That those are just um, pass, like texts from preachers. So that's what Muhammad was projected onto. But due to this referring back to Abraham, it, that created a theological need for this guarantor, which we've talked before, and not just a link between Arabs and Jesus, right? So initially, this would be a, would be a preacher who would bring the message of this uh, anti-Trinitarian Jesus to the Arabs, but that wasn't good enough anymore. Um, in order to be a guarantor, you need to be the seal of the prophets in this case. And now the Abbasids, they had a vested interest in this because as again, Raymond de Kerr found out in a, or as he published in a 2012 article, um, the Abbasids were actually a branch of the Umayyads. And so we have in the very oldest manuscripts to actually have some, um, an account of, of how this transfer took place. And this, and this account tells us where the name Abbasids comes from. And this name is, um, comes from Abbas, son of Walid. And in later, in, um, in the, but the Abbasids actually didn't want to be connected to the Umayyads, who were like the bad guys, right? So instead, they modified their genealogy in order to separate themselves from the rest of the family and instead create some kind of linkage to the Prophet. And that's why in later accounts, which is very interesting, it, it tells exactly the same story as, uh, as this account, which names Abbas. But the Abbas doesn't uh, isn't in there anymore. So they they took out this 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 part of the story that tells us about the origin of of the Abbasids, um, and that's why they had this vested interest in historicizing Muhammad as well. And it's not just theological interest, which they also had obviously, um, but it's also 
a power power game, right? So they want to um, establish themselves as le legitimate rulers by being connected um, to Muhammad. And that's when we see um, the historization of Muhammad as the praised one. We see the historization of Ali as the elevated one. Um, we see Merv being, or Marv, Merv being reinterpreted as Ma one, one and two, in order to fill those gaps in the genealogies. And we see that the pilgrimage to Mecca was then only established under the Abbasids. It didn't exist before. And the model for this new holy site was actually a Buddhist temple in uh, Balk in Afghanistan. That's Nava Vihara. And we actually have detailed accounts of that site from the eighth century, which describe it as a um, that the main temple had a stone cube in its center draped with cloth and that the devotees circum uh, circumambulated it and made prostration. Um, so actually these, these early accounts of this, uh, of this Buddhist site in bulk, we, if, if, you, if you take out bulk and give it to people, they would think it talks about Mecca. Um, yeah. And also like this, this stone cube that referred to the platform on which the stupa stood, which was a custom in Bactrian temples, and the cloth that's also typical for, for it's a typical Persian custom to show veneration. Um, so that's where this probably comes from. And then afterwards, also, this when we get this embellishment of the Muhammad uh, legend. A lot of this is probably written sort of in order to provide context to the Quran. Because remember, these old Quran passages. They only make sense in conjunction with the Bible. But now that you take it out of that context and, and create a separate um, separate scripture, um, a, lot of, a lot of it just doesn't make sense without knowing the context. So they sort of created a new one. They imagined stories of Muhammad's life that could explain these passages in the Quran. And that's where we get a whole lot um, of, of, the, of these hadiths from and, and this the Sira and the Sunnah. Um, these are basically just imaginations of, of what could explain those passages that we see here now that there's no longer this biblical context there. And that's something that actually, actually um, Gabriel Said Reynolds goes into, into detail uh, a lot, which is really interesting. But mix in between, there are also elements that read a lot like um, this guy, Abu Muslim al Khurasani, who toppled the Umayyad dynasty. His biography and that of Muhammad, they have lots of parallels. So there are some suggestions, suggestions that he might be a role model uh, and served sort of as, as a, yeah, it was copied, let's put it that way. Now let's jump to Al Mamun again. So now we're again in the ninth century. Uh, Al Mamun was son of Harun al Rashid. He was educated by famous Persian scholars. And in 809, he becomes governor of Merv. And again, he, like there, he's also exposed to a lot of Persian culture. In 811, his brother Al Amin, who was the ruler at the time, breaks with Al Mamun and marches into Iran. But by 813, um, he is beaten. And actually, uh, Al Mamun becomes the new caliph. And he's actually the first one to use that title, at least in the sense that we know of today. So Abdul Malik also used the, the term caliph, but as we've seen, it may, may have been mainly a, a eschatological thing, um, but al Mamun definitely uses it in the sense as we know it today. And he's the only one or the first one after Abdul Malik to use that word even. Um, in, 825, Al Mamun moves from Merv to Baghdad in order to fill the power vacuum that was in the center of his empire, which was a diverse metropolis with Jews, Buddhists, Zoroastrians, Manichaeans. Um, there was a lot going on. Um, so Al Mamun, he took his best scholars and he visited the western parts of his empires for the first time, and he had a focus on religious sites. Um, and this was, remember, this was a time when Aramaic was basically a dead language, at least yeah, in, in most of these parts. And Al Mamun, he renovates the Dome of the Rock and he adds diacritics to Abdul Malik's inscriptions, and thereby also solidifying this reading of Muhammad as the prophet of Islam. 
Um, under him, we also have the first appearance now of Islamic fundamentalism, that's this Hanbalism after Ibn Hanbal, who propagated a strict literal interpretation of the Quran. So we know by this time the Quran was firmly established as scripture. And um, yeah, well, I think we also went in, in when we looked at the timeline, we went that into this being the beginning of the Islamic Golden Age, that, but that it's really a misnomer that it should be the Persian Golden Age because it's really based on this Persian tradition um, of, of um, yeah, cherishing knowledge and, and, and gathering knowledge, which Al-Mamun was a proponent of, so he fought Hanbalism. But eventually uh, this literalism won out and then was then also the end of, the, of this golden age. And at this point, I want to quickly quote Ignaz Goldzier, who is always a good person to quote. He said, the history of the Arabs of Arab science begins with their contact and mixing with Persians. And the initiators of this scientific movement were mostly non-Arab foreigners, especially Persians, who, owing to the conquest, joined some Arab tribe through affiliation. Even the most celebrated founders and students of Arabic philo philology were Persians and Tatars, their names demonstrating that they hailed from Zamakhshar, Firushabad, Farab, and other places in Central Asia. The names of Sibawahi, and many others ending in Wahi, all being grammarians, are totally Persian. So again, what we see is that this is a Persian golden age, not an Islamic golden age. It was the Persians who really, well, even were the Arabic grammarians, like who, who came up with the grammar and, and developed the script and all of that. We were all Persians, not Arabs. Um, but then also around this time, this, this situation tipped over from um, I would say this anti-Trinitarian Christianity into Islam. Muhammad, by this time, Muhammad and Ali were now firmly historicized as real people, and the caliphate was anachronistically extended to all previous rulers, real or imaginary. Um, the Quran was finalized in the form, or almost in the form we know today, and so was the Arabic script. Muhammad was given his tomb in Medina, Ali was given a martyr legend. Uh, and, but for the non-Trinitarian Christians on the ground, not much change at first. Right? So they, their religious services, they would go on as always. So they didn't convert. It's just that the focus ever so slowly shifted. It's not something that anybody would have cautious, consciously experienced or, or thought about. It's just, yeah, at some point, yeah, well, this, this preacher that we have in our book, in the Quran, has, has been given a name. He's now it's Muhammad. And then he gained uh, over decades and, and centuries, this Muhammad gained in importance, right? So it's not something you would, you would actually realize. So you don't convert, it's just you, they evolved into a new religion. And then, yeah, this Quranic literalism, this gained influence culminating in Al-Ghazali in the 11th century, um, after whom the strict literal interpretation became the norm and the Persian golden age basically ended. And not to end with, I want to go back to one slide we had at the beginning, which now hopefully makes more sense to people. So here we have the way, um, the way all those different forms of Christianity are interconnected. And once again, I want to point out that these connect these gray connecting lines, they are not people, they are ideas. Sort of. So um, this Syrian anti-Trinitarian strand it's not that there were Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians who came together to form it. It's that their ideas stemmed from those two groups. Um, exactly. And then what's also in here is the, the, the color coding is sort of intended to, to, um, to show the cultural background. So these bluish colors, these are all Syrian. Um, the pink, that's Greek. Up here we have Egyptian in, in, with the monophysites. And then the Jewish cultural background is on the bottom with the Ebionites. And the distance between those lines somewhat uh, tells also the, the theological distance. I mean, it's not to scale, I guess, but the historians were a lot closer to the Catholics than to the Syrian anti-Trinitarians, whereas the Aryans were closer to the Syrian anti-Trinitarians. Yeah. Um, yeah, and Islam really only comes into being in the ninth century. But as you can see, it's a long um, process. It, it split off from the Syrian anti-Trinitarian uh, strand, probably already in, in the late sixth century, but it didn't really become its own religion until the ninth century. Yeah. 
And with that, I think we can come to the summary. So what we've seen is that Abdul Malik, he established this anti-Trinitarian Christianity of the Quran as a state religion and, and pushed it in his entire empire. He had a strict Arabization policy, which would, will become important later on, as we've seen. Um, Muhammad was initially a title for Jesus as the Blessed One. Only later was Muhammad understood as a name, first that of a preacher, then that of a prophet. Christian sources identify Arabs as heretical Christians for centuries, and there's no mention of a new religion until the ninth century. Slowly, this anti trinitarian Christianity evolved into a new religion, and that's Islam. And with that, we're at the end for today. This is, um, well, that's a lot that you've chewed off right there in this last segment. We've, um, what you have done, it's good, though. We have always initially, when we talked about Muhammad I and Muhammad II, we were trying to find a Muhammad in the 7th century, and I... And I've always kind of shook my head and say, we, you're just not going to find him, not the Muhammad that, uh, that the Muslims know. And I think this has been a, a, a real eye-opener. There is reference to Muhammad. You do refer to the 661 coin. Uh, there, that name is there. Uh, we do. You also zeroed in on the Dome of the Rock and, of course, the Muhammad that is there, the praised one or praised be. Uh, that you have uh, in all those inscriptions. Thank you for those inscriptions and unpacking it there. But this Muhammad that Mo'awiyah is talking about in 661, this Muhammad that Abdul Malik is introducing in 681 and then in 692 on the Dome of the Rock is nothing more than Jesus Christ. That's Muhammad one. So let's let's put a line under that and just say that's the Muhammad one. <laughs> that uh, the Muslims don't want us to talk about. They would rather say, this is a man. But again, they're looking from the ninth century. And the Muhammad that were, the Muhammad two that you, the Muhammad one, Muhammad two that you're talking about evolved. He didn't just come into history in one fell swoop. He wasn't just introduced as a man. What's fascinating is that you have these different Christian characters who are watching this happen and are responding to what they're seeing. To begin with, um, you have Isuyao, Isuyao who sees Isuyao who sees um, uh, this these her heresies going on amongst the Arabs, and he just sees it as benign. He doesn't pay much attention to it. By the time you get to the uh, time of Abdul Malik, uh, you then have Anastasius mm -hmm. Sinaita, who really is cautious and his warning be careful these people do not understand what we're talking about they don't understand our christology and that makes sense in the 700s because you have the dome of the rock you have the coins you have the caliphal protocols that are all attacking the divinity and the trinity and his sonship and by the time you get then to john of damascus you really get a, a real polemic against these are heresies folks be careful this is nothing to do with our jesus christ now we're starting to see if they're already creating uh, the, the name Muhammad is Jesus Christ, who is nothing more than a man, and he's certainly anti-Trinitarian. It then, you moved into what you were, and I thought was how you did that. You said not only was this politically happening, but this was in the po politics of the time. The Abbasids who come into power in the 750s, they want to distinguish themselves from the Umayyads who have come before, and they now really take this Muhammad and make him into a man. But once they do that, They've got to create a book because a man who is a prophet, who is this second Muhammad that you're now introducing. I like the way you mm -hmm. put that to second Muhammad. Every prophet has to have a book. And in order to have a book, you also need to have a foundation. And that foundation must be, we are the real Abrahamists. You think you're the Abrahamists? No, we are the ones that come from Abraham. And so we now have the man and the book. Now the book is starting to be introduced. But the book is all coming out of these other traditions of these other lectionaries, and as we've been going on, these Aramaic, which they can no longer read. This is now, they were Arabized because of Abdul Malik. He was the one that brought in this Arabization. And now that he's brought in this Arabization, Aramaic got lost. So you're seeing a text in front of you, which you can't even read. And uh, that's one reason I love what you're doing with your, uh, in your own channel, you're starting to show how this Arabization, once you introduce the Arabization, you then have to introduce the dots. And then once the dots are introduced, then you can pretty much put them where you want. And so you can see if you don't know the Aramaic from which these are derived, you put those dots wherever you want and you have all kinds of confusing texts. 
And so what's fascinating, the Abbasids bring in this man, Muhammad, who now needs to have a history, who needs to be founded on the Abrahamic ideal. But then you then need to have not only a book, then you need to give him a history. You need to give him a biography. Hmm. Well, lo and behold, when does that happen? That's not to the ninth century. And it's ninth century that you're saying that this all coalesces. It's exactly. during the, this golden era or this golden period of the Persian, you might say, the Persian area, which is Baghdad in that area, Merv and Baghdad. Mamun comes in, and this is kind of the big last hurrah of the Persians with Mamun, who brings all his intellectuals. He goes down to the Dome of the Rock. He refurbishes the Dome of the Rock, puts in the dots where they belong. See, I didn't know that until you just mentioned that, that actually those diacritical marks, because I remember thinking, hold on, what are those diacritical marks doing in 691? Well, they weren't there in 691. They were introduced by Mahmud in the 800s. So the 900s, the ninth century is when also the dots were put in. Once you put the dots in, you then are starting to canonize the text, aren't you? Because before that, that could have even been different. We don't even know what the original text is when you take the dots off. And that's why Luxembourg is so good, because he says, when you, those dots that are there, they're now solidified that this is the Muhammad of that period. No, it's the praised one, the praised be, if you look at the, uh, if you take the dots out and go back to the original Aramaic. Good stuff. Well, we're seeing from Muhammad 1 to Muhammad 2. Once you have the Muhammad 2, then you have the beginning of what we now know as Islam today. And I love what you did at the very end by putting that onto a graph. You're showing where the Monophysites, where the Catholics, where the Nestorians, and the anti-Trinitarians, of which their offshoot, then we get, of course, the Islam. But it really only comes into the Islam that you and I can recognize, the Islam that we know today, really in the 800s, which is the ninth century. And then that gets even strictly put together in 11th century, when you then have our, our, good, our good friend um, Al-Ghazali, who really then puts it down and solidifies it, which is a whole other chapter we're not going to get into at this point. That's a whole swath that you've done in just one episode. Whew. I have, My head's a little bit slip swing, but then you tend to do that with us. You're putting in an awful lot of material that much, there could be many episodes for each one of these. Thanks so much for doing this. I'm sure we're going to get a reaction to this. I'm sure those of you who are listening to this, you'll want to react. You'll have lots of questions. I have asked that uh, Thomas does come back and that we take your best questions and later on, not right away, because we have some, a lot of material coming in from Odin as well. He wants to get his uh, material out. Also, Joe, uh, some of you know Joe from Judaism. He wants to talk about the Huff's Quran itself and how to interpret the Huff's Quran, the finalized Quran that we find again. He's going to show you, much like what Luxembourg did, he's going to show you that we can unpack an awful lot of what we what was confusing to many scholars, he uh, will show you is not really that confusing. So all these need to come in. At the same time, I am also bringing in an awful lot of new material on the Zumzum well and on the Black Stone and on the Kaaba. It's exciting. There's just so much material coming in 2022. We're going to have to pack it all in and throw it at you and get you all the more confused. But can you see what we're doing? Can you see what Thomas is doing? And Thomas, I think you're the one that's been the clearest so far to really go through uh, chronologically and give us the chronology of the politics. Give us a chronology of the theology. Give us a chronology of what laid up and what became uh, the Islam that we know today. It did happen in a 22-year period, as the standard Islamic narrative was saying to us. Sin wants us to think that this all happened in 22 years, between 610 to 632, when the Quran came into being. No. When you start to put all these facts and figures, when you put the politics, when you put the, the theology, when you put everything that's happening on the ground, which is what we've asked you to do, which we ask any historian to do, what comes out at the end is actually a very logical sequence and actually a very logical political uh, uh, chrono chronology and also an, under a real anti-Trinitarian theological, uh, what do I want to say? An anti-Trinitarian theological entity is what you find down here. And that makes sense from the Islam that we see today. It's not Aryan, it's just anti-Trinitarian. And those are the ones that, that won out. Did they come from Merv? You say they came from Merv, from the Mudwan family. Regardless, what we do know is they did finally take over, and it is of the Malik who is the one that we need to really give an awful lot of credit to. Of the Malik has had a huge place in history. Uh, it looks like he's had a much greater place, not just in the fact that he Arabizes everything, not only just the fact that he introduces Muhammad as the person of Jesus Christ, but he really attacks the Trinitarian view of Christianity, the divinity of 
Christianity and the sonship of Jesus Christ. And in doing that, he laid this, the groundwork, the foundation for, for what Islam is today. And that is exactly the Islam that we're now coming in contact with from all our Muslim friends around us. Listen, you Muslims who are watching, this is something that you need to respond to. We'd like to hear your, your feedback. Uh, don't get upset. Listen, everything that Thomas has done is from the evidence. He's gone all the way back to the first century, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, up until the seventh and eighth century ending with the ninth century. He's done all of that. He is not sitting there and imposing the ninth and 10th century traditions, which you are dependent on. The standard Islamic narrative is full of holes. And that's what Yasser Qadi said back on June 8, 2020. The standard Islamic narrative is full of holes. And what we're doing is we're patching up those holes and we're putting it into a historical framework. Anything last word you want to say? Uh, no, I'm, I'm good. Uh, but, but I actually have two more episodes on the on the Islamization of Spain, which I think are really interesting to people and will also support um, what I've just laid out, this, this transition in the 9th century, which we can see in Spain probably more clearly even than, than here. Okay, so two more yet to come, folks. Sit tight. <laughs> We're going to get right to them and bring them to you. This is now moving over, over to the West. We'll be moving over to the West, to what was known as Andalusia. And then we'll be going out and introducing a form. Actually, you're going to do it as a model, aren't you? You're going to show it as a model of what we are talking about. Well, yeah, well, I, I will go through the sources that we have. We also have lots of Christian sources from uh, Spain during the time uh, of, of the so-called Islamic conquest. And what we will see is actually a very similar picture and a very clear picture that we are not dealing with uh, Muslims in the 8th century, that this only happens in a process during the ninth century. And in Spain is actually much quicker. So it's um, it's a, not as long of an evolution, but when it happens, it happens really quickly. Good stuff. Excellent. So that's where we're getting to next. Okay. Listen, thanks so much for your time. Remember, for those of you who don't know, what time is it right now there in Germany? Well, no, it's three in the morning. <laughs> three in the morning. I don't know how you do it. I'm sure I would be able to have this kind of cognitive ability like you do uh, three more, but then you're German. So I guess that makes sense. All right, let's go ahead and let's unpack this, put this to rest and move over to Spain, over to the West. Thomas and Jay, 4,000 miles apart, over and out. <laughs>